Now we're still in our series on faith, and we're still in Hebrews 11. It seems like the Holy Spirit has brought us back across the path of Moses again. And I don't know of a better place to be this morning than here, studying together and listening to the story of Moses' life. I'd like to read the text, first of all, in verse 23 of the 11th of Hebrews through the 29th verse. By faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents, because they saw he was a proper child, and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they pass through the Red Sea, as by dry land which the Egyptians, are saying to do, were drowned. I'm amazed at how often the lessons we learned on Thursday night on studying the Bible have been employed in this chapter in my life. I see here another temptation to depart from the outline the Holy Spirit has given us. Though we must be careful to exalt Christ, and to see Jesus in every passage of the Word, yet we may also be careful not to violate the Holy Spirit's train of thought, nor to break His outline. And the subject of the eleventh chapter of Hebrews is faith, practical kind of faith, the faith that saves us, and the faith that meets every trial and temptation of life, overcoming faith that has overcome the world. The subject is the Christian's walk, he walks by faith and not by sight. And the Holy Spirit is setting before us in Hebrews this vast array of characters to demonstrate that if they walk by faith, you can walk by faith. If they won victories by faith, you can win victories by faith. If they were not overcome of their enemies, you need not be overcome of your enemies. And to quote a phrase so often heard, if they endured to the end, you can endure to the end too. If the faith that saved them and called them and kept them and delivered them into the presence of God rejoicing, that same faith will call you and save you and see you through to the very end and deliver you once into the presence of God, safe and sound, just as the Bible promises. Inspired is a word that really belittles the impression that I get from this chapter. It inspires me greatly. It thrills me. It excites me when I see what happened in these ordinary lives of ordinary people. And to sense the potential of what might happen in my life and yours if we laid hold of this key and this secret, which is faith. So it's a temptation to turn the story of Moses into a glorious and wonderful type of Christ. Because he is. God promised to Moses when he was yet alive that he would send to the nation a prophet like him. That prophet was Jesus. So God himself said Moses was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ and all the, the glorious similarities in their lives. Predestined before he was ever born to be the deliverer of his people. Special revelation of God apparently to the parents of Moses as it was to Joseph and Mary about his greatness and his future and his destiny. The hatred of a hostile world upon him before he was ever born, working hardship in thousands of lives for the sake of killing this predestined man. Specially preserved by the power of God just as Jesus was and rose to greatness just as Jesus did exiled from his people, going away for a long season of time, not seen by the eyes of man, but to make a glorious return, victorious, and save his people out of the hands of their enemies and lead them into the promised land. Such a wonderful picture of what the Lord Jesus has done and what he's going to do for his people yet. 
But the story of Hebrews 11 is not the cross and it is not the life and the ministry and the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus. The subject is how a man was born and lived and died in faith. And how faith was the key and the secret of the apparent success of his life. In fact, I think Hebrews 11 is the story of faith itself as it relates to us. And everything we have learned so far in this chapter is employed in the story of Moses. So we can see the entire glorious truths of faith demonstrated in this one man's life. What is the story and what's the message? Well, beginning with Abel down to Moses already, we've learned that faith separates us and makes us a stranger in the world. Separated Abel from his brother, Cain. It cost him his life. Faith separated Enoch from the world he knew and caused him to walk with God in such communion that God finally took him and he was not, though the world searched for him. Faith separated Noah from his entire civilization and drove him to the shelter and refuge of the earth. Separated him from everything he knew of life around him and shut him up with God and in the fellowship of those who had like precious faith. Faith drove Abraham out of the city of Ur in the land of Chaldee, made him a stranger and a pilgrim in the land of Canaan. Separated him from Lot, separated him from his father, Terah, separated him from Ishmael, which at one time was the darling of his heart, separated him eventually from Isaac on Mount Moriah, from Sarah, his beloved wife, made him a pilgrim and a stranger and a wayfaring man and an exile, homesick for a city that no one could see but Abraham, for he saw it by faith longing after that day when he would enter into the gates of that city into the presence of the invisible God which Abraham saw and whose vision was filled with this wonderful person of God. So now we see all of these things wrapped up in the story of Moses. And the story of Moses unfolds in what I believe to be four very wonderful scenes. We're going to try and look at two scenes this morning, one Wednesday night, one next Sunday night, or one next Sunday morning. The first scene, notice carefully, is in verse 23. By faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child, and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. This is the first scene and the first phase of the story of faith, and it doesn't have to do with Moses' faith. It has to do with the faith of his parents. It has to do with faith that was operative in Moses' life before he was born. Remember me commenting on this not long ago? About generations before and the grace of God preparing the way? Here was faith at work in Moses' parents before he was ever born. And the faith that was demonstrated in Moses' life, seen to, is only really the faith of his father and mother. Now alive in Moses. So if I don't get anything else said... It's worth saying this, that you mothers and fathers have the glorious privilege of passing on the faith you possess to your children. If your children do not see you walk by faith, how shall they walk by faith? If there is no reality to faith in your life, will there be any reality to faith in their lives? Faith was real in the life of Moses' mother and father. So real they laid down their lives risk their lives to do what they believed the invisible God had led them to do. This faith had effect on this son. And it became alive in him. And scene two shows us the faith of Moses, which was really the faith of his mother and father, which was really the faith of their fathers. And Abraham, you know, was the seventh removed from Moses, and Moses was the seventh generation after Abraham. So it was really the faith of Father Abraham at work right on down through until it was displayed in the glorious life of Moses. But oh, it doesn't stop there. 
The faith of Moses' mother and father brought this man to know Christ. And at the crossroads of life, he laid everything down for the sake of Christ. And the faith that possessed him affected an entire nation and led them to Jesus and the sprinkling of the blood, you'll read in the following verses. And the faith that came through Amram and Jochebed, the mother and father of Moses, and so affected the life of this one man, and so spilled out of this vessel, filled to overflowing, until it affected his entire nation, also spilled out over the, Egypt, over the Egyptian nation and brought them to condemnation and judgment in the sight of God and saved the people. That's a story, isn't it? So, I'll tell you my story. Scene one. Scene one. We take up where we left off last Wednesday night. Joseph was the governor in Egypt. Direct descent of Abraham, brought there by the grace of God, risen to the throne, to the mercies of God. Used to save his own family in famine. And through the exercise of this glorious office which had been given to Joseph, he was the cause of his father Jacob bringing their entire tribe or their entire family into the land of Egypt to live. It came time that Jacob should die, and he did, and they buried him, and Joseph died, and they buried him with the promise that God would someday visit his people and take them out of this land of Egypt. And when they went, they were to take Joseph's bones with them. And the years passed. And another Pharaoh came to the throne in Egypt. And the book of Exodus tells us that this Pharaoh didn't remember Joseph. There was a change of administrations and new politics had taken over in the White House. And he no longer remembered this man, Joseph, who had served so faithfully and honored his family in their midst. And the first thing this Pharaoh did when he came to the throne was appraise the political situation in the land of Egypt. And he became greatly alarmed because he saw that the children of Israel were multiplying so rapidly. The nation was becoming stronger and stronger. And as he saw that there was a nation within a nation and realized that the nation of Israel could never, never, never homogenize with the Egyptians... He became concerned about the day when the Israelites became stronger than the Egyptians. And he feared a civil war. And he tried what Hitler tried to no avail. A purging of the Jew. So there were first of all the plan to curb the people explosion in Egypt. Does that ring a bell about our modern times? And the first attempt was to call the midwives in from among the Hebrews and order them by governmental order that starting that very day, every boy, baby, born to the Hebrew women should be put to death immediately at the moment of his birth. We've gone back a step further today. Now we're doing it in abortion. So it didn't work. The Hebrew midwives warned of God not to cooperate with such a plan. Refused. And when they were called in and questioned, they gave the excuse that the Hebrew women had been given apparently some kind of special grace by the Lord in the delivery of their babies. Because the midwives said that they came so quickly that they weren't allowed to even attend them. And they were born before they could do anything about it. And so a new governmental order went out, and it went like this. He said, all right, then, every boy, baby born in this land, the Hebrews starting today, must be cast into the river Nile, drowned, put to death. And this was the order that went out from the capital. This was the order of the law of the land. And now the scene shifts to the home of Amram and Jochebed. And the story of the foundling prince. Because there in the land of Egypt was a Jewish couple, both descendants of Levi, of the godly tribe and the priestly tribe, both steeped not only in the traditions of their fathers, but in the law of God. They believed in this invisible God. They loved this invisible God. 
He to Amram and Jochebed were greater. He was greater than Pharaoh, greater than Egypt, greater than life. Pharaoh had given an order that violated the law of nature and the law of God. And the law of the land could never take precedent in their hearts above the law of nature and the law of God. And so they did what they knew was right to do. Now, I've read a lot of background on the story of Amram and Jochebed because uh, Josephus has quite a little bit to say about it. And I don't have any reason to doubt what he reports because remember, Moses was a national hero. And not only was he a national hero, he was the greatest of all the great men in Israel. And many, many traditions were passed down about this man. But the story goes that Amram and Jochebed discovered that they were to have a child. And when conception had taken place, they became greatly troubled, fearing that if it were a boy child, they would be forced to throw him into the river and take his life. But during this time of concern, Josephus says that God spoke with Amram in the night. And he said, don't be afraid to do what you know is right. I'll take care of you. You're supposed to obey the laws of the land, but when the laws of the land violate the laws of God in the conscience of the Christian, then he must obey that higher law and that spiritual law, which is God himself. And he said to Amram, don't be afraid. Do what you know is right. And I'll take care of you. And then he rehearsed in Amram's heart the history of his people. Remember how I took care of your father Abraham? When he was in the land of Chaldea and I led him forth and preserved him in all of his days. Remember how I took care of Isaac? And remember how I took care of Jacob? Oh, that glorious story of Jacob, object of grace. We had it Wednesday night. And he reminded Amram that he had taken care of Joseph even though he'd been cast out and sold as a slave. God looked after him, took care of him. He said, don't be afraid. I'll take care of this baby when it comes. Now, Josephus also says, and you can believe it or not believe it, whatever you want to do, that after God had told him this, he also told him about the destiny of this baby that was to be born. And told him that he was indeed the promised deliverer of the people. I'm inclined to believe that because of the fact that the Scripture says that Moses had some sense of his destiny long before the experience at the burning bush. For 40 years before that, he had tried to assume the role of leadership among the Jews. It says that he was stirred in his heart to do this, something that he had known from the day he was born that he was destined to be the deliverer of his people. And so Amram and Jochebed after having received this communication from God, wait with fear and trembling for the birth of this baby. <clears throat> now Josephus also says, and I'm, I keep quoting him because I want you to know I'm not quoting this from the Bible. He said that God gave to Jochebed, the mother of Moses, a miraculous delivery at six months instead of nine. And so Moses being a six months baby, they had three months before the world would discover the birth of the baby. And this accounts for the three months that Amram and Jochebed hid him from the eyes of the world. And if you'll let me depart in just a spiritual application for a few minutes, remember what I told you one other time on the message of Moses. That the world is afraid of the children of God. And all godly parents have the same desire that Amram and Jochebed had. And that was to create for Moses a sheltered life. A life where he wouldn't see the world, wouldn't hear the world, wouldn't be in contact with the world. So they hid him. They hid him from that world outside. But also there came in their lives the same time that comes to us. When we can no longer hide our children from the world. What then shall we do? Oh, any Christian father that knows the world for what it is and sees the world for what it is and has experienced the world for what it is would give everything he owns to hide his children in his home forever. To keep them from that world, from ever discovering what it's all about out there. But he can't. The time comes 
when he can't hide them anymore and he must give them up. And it came with Amram and Jacob that they had to give this baby up. Though he was special to them. And they saw from the moment that he was born that he had divine favor. He was beautiful to their sight, but the Hebrew brings out that the beauty they saw in Moses was a spiritual beauty. Oh, how they coveted this child for the glory of God. Oh, how they longed to see him grow up in purity. And oh, how they longed to save him from the world. But we can't do that. So when that time in life comes, we must do exactly as this godly mother did. Take our children and commit them to the ark. That ark, as you well know, is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a fulfillment of the ark of Noah, pitched with pitch within and without. And Leviticus 17:11 informs us that that pitch was the atoning work of the cross. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of of the ark of Moses to which Jacob had committed him. Sanctify, Jesus prayed in the garden, sanctify by thy word, or sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. And this is the way we must set our children aside for God. Teach them the truth of God, pass on to them the truth of God, demonstrate the truth of God, walk in the reality of the truth of God in our lives, and when that time comes that they are committed to the ark, the Lord Jesus Christ, we just have to take our hands off of them and let them go. And she launched Moses on the river of life, I'm sure, with prayer and with much sorrow, and committed him <laughs> to the only one who could save him, the only one who could bring him back, the only one who could give him back to her, in a way that she had never possessed him before. God is the only one to whom we can commit our children and trust him to give them back, if it please him, in his own good time, in a more glorious way than we ever possessed them. Much rather, and I know this is a severe statement, much rather to be deprived of our children forever than to have them without Christ. <coughs> Isaac, you see, and Abraham's relationship was ended at Moriah. It came to an end. Abraham wanted him back from God in a way he would never lose him. Abraham wanted him by faith. Abraham wanted him glorified. Abraham wanted him as the gift of God twice full. And he got him that way. Now, I don't know what I'm trying to say, except that parents sometimes would rather have their children's fellowship, though they be unsaved, than to stand for the truth of God, commit them to the ark, and let go of them in the simple faith that God in his own wisdom and in his own time will give them back in a spiritual way so that they will never lose them. So they committed this child to the ark and they set him adrift in the stream of life and prayed and trusted the invisible God to return him to their home. Well, it's a wonderful thing that happened to him. Uh, he had a sister, you know, and her name was Miriam. And Josephus has some details about this same story, and they fit the framework of the record of God's Word. <clears throat> How that that day came that Jochebed and Amram carried the little ark which they'd made with their own hands, and pitched it carefully within and without with bitumen and slime. And there in that little tiny ark, safe from the river, but carried by the course of it, went Moses. And apparently, Jochebed said to Miriam when they set the ark adrift, Miriam, you won't be so obvious. You wander along the river bank and keep your eye on the ark. And tell me what happens to it. And so the little cradle drifted down the River Nile. And lo and behold, it drifted right into that very portion of the River Nile where the princess, the daughter of the Pharaoh, and her, her servant girls had come. And the princess wanted to take a bath in the river. She wanted to swim. 
And so they were having a good time along the riverbank when one of her servants happened to notice this little cradle drifting down the river Nile. Joseva says she dispatched two of her very best swimmers. And they went out and retrieved this cradle because she was so fascinated with it. And as they towed it into shore and delivered it to the princess, she looked down into that tiny cradle and into the most beautiful face she had ever seen in all her life, a face that manifested something unearthly. For over and over, even Stephen in his message before the Sanhedrin makes note of the beautiful countenance of Moses. There was a spiritual beauty connected with this baby that made him the talk of the town. When he grew to manhood, Josephus records how the Egyptian people would stop on the street when Moses went by and stare in wonder, so stricken with the beauty of this man. Yet it was not a physical beauty as much as it was a spiritual attraction in this man that others noticed. And this princess came under the spell of this charisma while Moses was yet a baby. And as she looked upon his face, he wept. I don't think he cried like babies just cry because they want their pants changed or want something to eat or want attention. He wept. I think there was a spiritual compassion manifested in Moses and a, and a foreview of the compassion he would one time feel for the entire nation. And the tears of this baby so touched the heart of Pharaoh's daughter, the princess, that she said to her, her servants, she said, why, this is one of those Hebrew babies. And she said, I'm just going to keep this baby. I can't, I can't throw the baby back in the river. There's something about this baby. There's something special about this baby. I'm going to keep this baby. And then Josephus says that she called several Egyptian nurses and tried to find a suitable Egyptian nurse who could nurse by the breast this baby. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> he also records how time after time the princess would bring a, an Egyptian nurse and Moses would refuse the breast. And they really had a problem. They couldn't get him to eat. And Miriam, standing by, observing all of this, used of God came along and said, well, maybe it's because you're offering him the breast of a strange nation. Why don't you call for some Hebrew mother? And maybe then he would eat. And the princess said, now it sounds like a good idea. Could you find us one? And she went back to her home and called her mother and brought her into the presence of the princess and she was appointed a full-time nurse for her own baby. <coughs> Pardon me. And then a glorious reward of faith. She gave him up. <laughs> Within 24 hours, she had him back and not even Pharaoh himself could take him away from her. Isn't that wonderful? You just step out there on the void and there's the rock. She gave him to God and got him back in 24 hours. As I said, in a way that Pharaoh himself couldn't take him away. Well, how do you mean by that? Well, just the way things worked out. She began to nurse and take care of this little baby. And he was so fair and so attractive and the princess was so very much in love with him that she being the eldest daughter of Pharaoh and her first son being the rightful heir to the throne, though she had no son, she deemed it wise to make Moses her adopted son. And one day, Josephus says, she carried this little baby into the presence of the king of Egypt, which almost represented the king of the entire world at the time. And when she approached the throne, she held forth this beautiful baby to Pharaoh, and he said, he's mine. And I want him to be the heir to the throne. I want him to be my legally adopted son. It's recorded how Pharaoh took that little baby and put him on his lap, and he loved him too. And he hugged him, Josephus said. And playfully, he reached up and took his crown and he placed it on this little tiny baby's head. And Josephus said that Moses snatched the crown and cast it to the floor. And standing by the throne of Pharaoh was his chief spiritual advisor, would you believe the false prophet? Some good reverend from the ministerial alliance had been appointed to the throne room. He became the spiritual advisor to the Pharaoh, and the Pharaoh turned around and said, what's this all mean? And the priest said to him, beware. For I have learned by a spirit. 
but this man will be the undoing of your throne. And this is a prophecy, how he has taken your crown and thrown it down in contempt. Kill him while there is yet time. Kill him. Your law is still in effect. Kill this baby. But Pharaoh saw the love of his daughter for this child. And he said, no, he will be the heir to my throne. And Pharaoh took him as his very own. Now, oh, what a life he had. It was quite a life. Scripture says that, of course, he lived in the palace. And over and over, <coughs> there is attention drawn to, the, to the, the superior intelligence of this man. And a brilliant mind. He was outstanding. He was a striking kind of personality. There was this charisma about him that, that Stephen mentions. And Moses, in writing the book of Exodus, even makes mention of it himself. Josephus records how it was passed down by tradition that there was a special, special charisma about this man. His extreme intelligence, his striking manner, made people stare when he walked down the streets. He was raised in the Egyptian courts. He was trained in all of their schools. He was introduced to all of the Egyptian mysteries, many of them never, never, never allowed outside their own people. He was initiated into all of the secret cults and learned all of the mysteries of that very, very mysterious land. And when he'd finished his university training and had taken a place beside his adopted father in a time of great war with the nation of Ethiopia, Josephus says that Pharaoh called Moses in and entrusted the entire Egyptian army to his command. He became the commander-in-chief of the armed forces of Egypt, and he went out in a great campaign against the mightiest nation of his time, which was the nation of Ethiopia. <clears throat> there are two interesting little traditions passed down about that campaign that demonstrated the brilliance and the strategy of this man. One <clears throat> was a particular place that they wanted to capture, a very vital and strategic uh, place that they wanted to capture. And the only way that they could get in to this particular place by land was across a strip of ground that was notorious for being populated with snakes, a very, very poisonous kind of Egyptian viper or asp. And they, they just crawl all over the place. And so the commander of the Ethiopian army said, we'll never have to guard from that direction because all the Egyptians know about the snakes. Nobody will ever cross that piece of ground. It's impassable to foot soldiers. So we'll have to look from the, from the sea and from another direction. And Moses, using reverse psychology, said, they'll never expect us from the snake side, so that's the side we're going to go through. And all of his officers said it's impossible. <coughs> Why, the army would die from snake bite. He said, maybe not. And so he discovered that there was a bird in the land of Egypt that loved snakes. <laughs> And he was the natural enemy of this particular kind of snake. And so Moses sent his soldiers out and they captured all the birds they could capture. They put them in baskets. And when they arrived at this particular strip of snake-infested land, they turned all the birds loose. And the birds did their thing. And when they had done their thing, the troops went across. With very little loss, they attacked this strategic fortress completely by surprise. And he became a legend for his strategy. And another little thing he did, too. I don't know how to interpret this, but there was one last city where the Ethiopian army had made a stand, and Moses was busy outside the wall setting up his weapons of war for this last great assault against this city. It was an impregnable fortress. And he wondered how in this world he was ever going to take it. But inside the fortress was the daughter of the Egyptian king, or the Ethiopian king. And she was watching the battle progress from the wall of the city, and she saw Moses, and she fell in love with him. She just couldn't take her eyes off of that striking battle commander out there as he was going about his duties. So she sent a very trusted messenger by night to his tent and told him of her love for him. And because of that love, she was going to deliver the city into his hand, which she did, which wasn't too bad a shape. 
And these are a couple of the legends that made him great in the land of Egypt. So he had this brilliant command of the army, and he had this tremendous tradition following him. He was national hero. He rose to the heights of glory in Egypt. And this is where we find him as the scene shifts. We go back to Hebrews for scene two. Something's bothered Moses. I'm sure that Pharaoh noticed it, and I'm sure the princess noticed it, and I'm sure that everyone in the palace noticed it. He was distracted. He had kind of an out-to-lunch type of attitude. Oh, it wasn't that he was bored. There was much to keep him active. There was the pleasures of sin, the seasonable luxuries of a riotous life of a palace prince, there was the whining and the dining and the making merry and the travel and the new learning. There was all of the things at his disposal of the wealth of Egypt. And oh, it was a wealthy place. So wealthy that they built treasure cities to contain all of the wealth that belonged to the throne. But there was something about Moses. Distracted is the word. I'm sure they spoke to him many times when he didn't answer. Talked to him when he didn't hear. He said, what, what was that? And this distraction was a spiritual distraction. Moses had a, a conviction of an unfulfilled destiny. He just sensed that even though he had arrived, he was still nowhere. And even though he was somebody, he was still no one. And that there must be more to life than just riding around in a chariot, spending money, leading armies, and sitting on the throne of Egypt. For even pharaohs die, and time goes on. And there was this spiritual uneasiness, this spiritual unrest. This sense of being unfulfilled in life. You know what I'm talking about? You ever feel it? This treadmill type of thing, that I'm getting nowhere fast. And somehow I even haven't discerned where I ought to be going. And if you'll allow me to quote my friend Tevye, the time had come in Moses' life when he had to decide who he was and what God expected him to do. And somehow down inside, Moses knew. And faith, this is the point, changed his life. And faith changed his destiny. And faith changed the course of civilization. And faith changed the history of the world because of the uneasiness of Moses' heart. That's the power of faith. Faith rewrote the history of the Jews. And faith rewrote the history of Egypt and brought them under eternal condemnation and historical decline. And faith changed not only this man, but changed his own people and the nation they served. And I think it's interesting that this faith was not altogether Moses. It went back to Jochebed and Amram. And it went back to Korath, the father of Amram, and the father of Korath, whose name was Levi, and the father of Levi, whose name was Jacob, and the father of Jacob, whose name was Isaac, and the father of Isaac, whose name was Abraham. And the faith Abraham had, he got by direct gift of grace from God. So it was God's faith operating in this man Moses that made him uneasy and made him aware that he didn't belong to the world that claimed him. There came a time in his life when faith stirred him up and made some things very, very real to him. Tired of masquerading. Tired of being owned by the world he knew in his heart he didn't belong to. Tired of hiding behind this image, which he didn't create, but an image which he now must destroy. Tired of being associated with the world that his heart told him he had no portion in. Faith laid hold of some realities and caused him to do a little thing described by one verb, refuse. He refused by faith when he was come to years to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. This is a very negative thing. He just said, no more. 
I can't do it anymore. All these years, it referred to me as the son of Pharaoh's daughter, the son of Pharaoh's daughter, the son of Pharaoh's daughter. There goes the son of Pharaoh's daughter. There goes the son of Pharaoh's daughter, a worldling, a prince in the world. And Moses came to the place in life where he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter anymore. This came with the power of faith. Faith had laid hold of some reality. Number one, he laid hold of the true value of Pharaoh's family. And he also laid hold of the true value of God's family. And he decided that one course was worldly and the other was heavenly. He decided one was spiritual and one was fleshly. He decided that one ended in death and one ended in life. One was God and one was Satan. And he had to make up his mind what family he belonged to and what God he would serve. One was a materialistic world where the value was placed in dollars and cents on everything around him, on success, on attainment, on power, on authority. And in this other world, in this other family, in this other realm, there were spiritual values. Man had to walk by faith and see what the eye couldn't see, lay hold of things that the hands couldn't touch. He had to walk with a God that was invisible and have nothing more, nothing less than the word, the pledged promise of this God to enable him to endure. And he looked at both ways and he had to decide which way he would go at this particular point in his life. And oh, how I thank God for that faith. A mother's faith that wouldn't let him go. A father's faith that committed him to the ark and trusted God to give him the courage to make a decision he had to make sometime in life and every one of us have had to make it and every one of us will have to make it if we came from a home where faith was real and where God's word was real. And he made his that day. I see him in his bedroom. I like to think of him pacing the floor and looking out over the balcony and there's the whole land of Egypt before him and there's the treasure city. Now, I don't know, maybe even the great pyramid of Gaza. And he sees it all and he, he knows that it stands for the throne and he is the right to that throne. He has the right to this particular power. It's all out there. The pleasures of sin are there, the court life, the acclaim, the plaudits, the fame, the glory. But there's this voice within him and says, Moses, you don't belong to that world. It glitters for the moment. It's glorious for the moment. It seems attractive. But oh, Moses, this is a dying world you're looking at. This world is going down the drain. You don't belong to that family. You belong to God's family. And the city you should have your heart set upon is one that has foundations whose builder and maker is God. Your father Abraham saw it by faith, Moses. And he endured and he gave up everything that you're now looking at in order to sit in his tent door and wait the day when he would walk in that city, that Mount Zion, where the sprinkling of blood is and where I am. Moses made his decision. He says God's family is more real than the world's family. And so starting today, I like to think that he just appeared at breakfast one morning and he said to the Pharaoh, Sir, and to his mother, that is his lawful mother, the daughter of Pharaoh, mother, I have something I want to say. I've lived a lie all these years. You've called me your son, but I'm not. I'm the son of God and the son of my father Abraham. You said I belong to Egypt, but I don't. I belong to Israel. You say I will sit in that throne, but I cannot. There is a throne greater than that one, sir. And my rights are there. You say I will reign, but I cannot reign apart from the glory of Christ. You've offered me everything in your world. But you have not been successful in giving me the one thing I must have. And that's peace with God and the joy of the Lord. So starting today, don't ever refer to me as your son again. I appreciate what you've done, but I see the end to which I'm hastening. This day, I'm taking my stand. I belong to Jesus, and starting today, I'm going to live like I belong to Jesus.
And starting today, I'm going to take my place with the people of God. And whatever suffering belongs to them, it will belong to me. Whatever sorrow they share, I will share. Whatever burdens they carry, I will carry. Whatever life they live and whatever portion their lot in this society, it will be mine. Starting today. So it said he chose. That's the positive. The negative was he refused, and the positive is he chose. He made a willful, positive choice, and he based that choice upon faith again. Faith had made some unseen things real to him. Let me tell you what those realities were. Number one, the true nature of affliction was revealed to Moses. What does the New Testament say about affliction in the lives of the people of God? Why well, it says it's temporal. It just lasts for a while. It's fleeting. For a moment, Peter says, you may be suffering. And he saw that the affliction that had come into the lives of the people of God was a momentary passing thing. And he saw this, that it was all bearable because of the sweet comfort of fellowship with God's people. Now, how, where am I getting all that? Am I getting any of that out of the Bible? Yes, right here. It says, choosing, rather, to suffer affliction with, you see that word, the people of God. Oh, the sweet comfort of fellowship with God's people. He hadn't been enjoying that, you see. How could he have fellowship with God's people? How could darkness have fellowship with light? How could Pharaoh's household sit down and eat with God's household? They were slaves, and Pharaoh's throne was the power that had enslaved them. How could a man friendly with the world have fellowship with those who had taken their stand against the world and had brought down upon them the reproach of Christ? Ah, I kind of think, secretly, that this lack of fellowship, this inability to enjoy the fellowship of God's people was perhaps one of the inward pressures that brought Moses to the crossroads. Would you believe I've told you many times, I'll tell you again. Occupying a chair in this union hall doesn't give you fellowship with the saints. The fellowship of God's people is a very real and a very sweet and a very precious comfort. To those who can partake of it, those who are enabled to partake of it, that enablement belongs to the Spirit of God alone. And he knows who belongs to the world and he knows who belongs to God. Moses had been shut out of all of that. When Israelites got together and talked about their glorious heritage, their past, the promises, when they talked about the land someday, they knew by faith they'd walk through from Dan to Beersheba that flowed with milk and honey. Moses listened, but he was miserable. He was miserable because in his heart he was never sure that he belonged to that world. He had no opening into that flock. And I think the hunger for fellowship with God's people was one of the inward pressures that brought Moses to the crossroads. And one day he said, I've got to make up my mind. I can't walk with one foot in the Jewish nation and one in the Egyptian nation. I can't walk with one in the world and one in heaven. I've either got to live like a worldling for the rest of my life and take my stand with the world, or I've got to make up my mind that I don't belong to that world and take a spiritual stand and walk a spiritual life and live by faith as my fathers before me had done. And he saw the cost. It was suffering affliction with the people of God. But he knew that affliction was temporary and he knew the fellowship of God's people was real. And he saw something else. He saw the shortness of time in which to enjoy sin's pleasures. Hey, sin affords some momentary pleasure, only to the flesh. The flesh for a moment is gratified, but oh, how brief is that season. Even now, some of you can testify that the pleasures of sin, which you once so greatly lusted for, oh, those pleasures don't seem as great to you now as they once did. Not as important as they once were. Time has changed all of that. The season is a very, very short one. And another thing that was made real to Moses, he saw that that season would end someday. And what he had sown, he would reap. So he looked at the pleasures of sin for a season. 
Oh, I don't think by that that the Holy Spirit means to imply that Moses lived in such licentiousness. It wasn't that he was just so ridden with vice that he couldn't give up these pleasurable things. I think when he refers to the pleasures of sin, it was more than just vices and habits. It was Egypt, with all of its challenge, with all of its thrill. And many and many a worldly man was worldly not because he was eaten up with the lust of the flesh, but with the pride of life, with the challenge of life itself, with the thrill of life itself, wanting to be something in a world where he should desire to be nothing. This was the pleasures of sin for Moses. And as he saw all that lay on that side of his life, he looked to the other side and he saw God's people, a slave people, filled with bitterness and in bondage and bearing with rigor the burden of the taskmasters, standing in slime to their knees and making bricks to build treasure cities for a materialistic world. And he had a choice. And faith brought some very wonderful realities to Moses' heart. Number one, what made him judge or account or esteem the riches of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt? Well, leave me with only one true conviction, that is that Moses knew Christ. How could he put any value on the riches of Christ if he didn't know the possessor of those riches? Well, it raises a question. How did Moses know Christ? He knew him by faith. That's what the chapter is about. Faith implies hearing. Moses had heard. Who told Moses about Christ? Amram and Jochebed. I believe that when Jochebed put that little baby boy in that ark and put him on the River Nile, she could very possibly have breathed the very precious name of Christ over him and committed him to the promises of Christ until that day. Oh, you know, you don't talk to babies in spiritual words because you say babies can't understand. That shows you how much we still believe that the Holy Spirit depends on our brains to make the truth of God known. You believe that the Holy Spirit could reveal to a baby the reality of Jesus? I'm positive. I'm positive. Because of, unless all of us, pardon me for taking it out of its context, become as little children, we can't see the kingdom of God. That doesn't mean little school-age children who can read and write and reason. Babies who cannot reason can also learn of the preciousness of Christ by the Holy Spirit, even as we have learned. Well, there's so much that just wants to hang on to the, to the pride of man, that man has some capability, some ability to do these things. No. I don't know where Moses heard first about Christ. I'll wager he heard about him first in the home of Amram and Jochebed. And he wasn't anybody's dummy. He'd read the Hebrew Scriptures. And the point is that he believed what he had read and he believed what he had heard. And down in Moses' heart, though his life didn't show it and though the world hadn't realized it and though his parents must have been heartbroken as they read the outward signs of his life, down in his heart, this man knew the Lord Jesus Christ, believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, and loved the Lord Jesus Christ for he couldn't have done what he did without it. And one day... The true value of Christ's riches was revealed to him and Christ became the object of his affections and the power that motivated him to make his break with the world. What do you think of the riches and the treasures of Egypt compared with the riches and the treasures of Christ? He thought the same thing Paul thought when he said it was all done. Did you ever get wrapped up in materialism or get wrapped up in the pride of some possession? Maybe a house, maybe a car, maybe some other material thing. And you didn't realize it and you didn't mean to. It just kind of is dropped out, you know what I mean? Just sneaked up on you. And one day, the Holy Spirit took you in hand and took you back to the cross. <laughs> and showed you what it was all about. And you saw Jesus again. 
and you saw spiritual values again and you got your eyes on the invisible God again and you looked back to that possession and lo and behold it turned to dust before your very eyes didn't it? Done. You couldn't have cared less who possessed it or who used it or whether you lost it or kept it. That's what happened to Moses one day. He just got up and all Egypt died before his very eyes. He looked out over the land one day and he said, there isn't anything out there that's worth a tinker's dam. And that isn't profanity. Look it up in your dictionary. There isn't anything out there that has any value at all. The only value is in Jesus Christ. And the only reality is in God's family. And the only thing I know for sure and can count on for sure in his life is that someday God will take us out of this place and into a place of spiritual rest where we shall dwell in his presence and I want to be in that number. And that was the day he said goodbye to the world. I imagine women all cried, don't you? <laughs> Moses wasn't going to show up to parties anymore. Now I imagine the court was greatly distressed that they couldn't depend upon the genius of this man anymore. I have an idea his mother, I'm talking about Pharaoh's daughter, was pretty upset about the whole matter. I have an idea Pharaoh had a prune or two to soak until recess too. And I have an idea that slimy ooze in through the crack spiritual father of the Egyptian court came to remind him about what he told him to. See if you'd have paid attention to me. But you didn't. See, he had some truth, didn't he? Where'd he get it? Well, the devil dispenses truth to you now. Not in its purity, nor in its entirety. Just enough to make it deceptive. So Moses made his choice. And the reward became apparent to him. What is the reward? A crown in glory with many stars for Moses? Oh, no. A little cabin in the corner of glory land? Oh, no. What is the reward? Then he will walk the golden streets and wear them golden slippers? No. The reward was Jesus. The reward was Jesus. And he saw that someday Jesus, not Christ, but Jesus, would be revealed to him. And so, the last thing he did, denoted by our last verb here, which tells the rest of his story, is he forsook. He forsook. What did he forsake? Well, it says that he forsook Egypt. Not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Number one, he got up one morning, Egypt died, he saw Egypt for what it really was, and he forsook it. What did he see Egypt as? He saw it as a hostile nation to the people of God. He saw them as haters of the God he loved. He saw them as a nation, as an instrument in the hand of the devil to keep God's people in bondage. And he saw them as a nation under the pending wrath and judgment of God. And so, Moses, getting the right view of Egypt land, also came into the right view and discerned the true nature of the king's wrath. How did he see the king's wrath? Didn't scare him at all. Why didn't it scare him? Number one, he saw that the king of Egypt himself was subject to the will of God. He recognized no second causes in his life. And he saw that if the king pursued him to the end of the world, God would use it all for his glory and Moses' good. And he knew one thing, there is a mighty protection. Oh, I wish you could all learn this and I can learn it too. There's a tremendous safety, security in the will of God. You know that? It's the only safe place to be. It may bring the wrath of the king down for a little while upon you, and it may bring the wrath of a whole nation upon you for a little while. John the Baptist, a perfect example. But they couldn't touch a hair on John's head until God wanted him to come to glory. Then he'd give John's head to the world if they wanted it. But he took John himself with him. A man is immortal in the will of God until God says come. You can walk through the battlefields of the world with not even a hat on your head and be safe. You can walk through this hostile land out here 
Not a hair of your head can perish. Not a sparrow falls to the earth out here in this big, vast, wonderful world that my Father in heaven doesn't take special note that a sparrow has fallen and the life of that little sparrow which came from him was taken. How much more careful and how much greatly is his concern, greater is his concern for me, a child of God, purchased, redeemed with the blood of his own son and heir to his own throne. He sends angels to look after me for fear that I will stub my toe on a stone that someone has put in my path. He bears me up with angel hands lest I hurt myself. He watches over me while I sleep. And no matter how hostile the land and no matter how bitter the battle, I can lay down in my tent at night and sleep like a baby because out yonder on the hills are the chariots and the horsemen of fire and angels camped about in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night between me and every host that would harm me. Hedges all about. Watchmen on the walls crying day and night into the ears of my father, lest some ill betake me, some evil overtake me. Why, Moses was immortal until God did through Moses what he knew he would do before he was ever born. No Pharaoh could kill him. We're going to have the story of the Red Sea next Sunday morning. No army could overtake him. No waters could overflood him. No fire could burn him. This man is immortal until God's finished with him. So am I. So are you. So don't worry. Next time your nose runs and you get a tummy ache, you're not going to die. You are immortal until the will of God has worked out in your life the way he chose to do it. Believe that or not, do you? It's the only thing I ever know when I hear some of you say, I wish I could just go home to be with the Lord. I always have to say, well, that must be some good reason for you being here. Because the Lord heard you say that too, you know, and he could just say, okay, come on. I know she never said it too loud. <laughs> well, rather than Pharaoh, as far as Moses was concerned, was a chain lion. He wasn't a bit afraid. He didn't fear the wrath of the king. And the secret of it all, and the secret of everything that had happened in this remarkable man's life, was that he endured, that is, he patiently waited by this power. He saw, he saw the invisible one. A person, not a thing. Abraham was looking at a city, more or less, but this man had had set before him the wonderful vision, the wonderful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. He endured as seeing him who is invisible. When you get in any trouble in this world and you find yourself more part of the world than you are of God's family for just a season, it will be because you've taken your eyes off him, the invisible one, and placed them on the glitter of this world around you. So, now we're going to leave this man here and take up his cause next Wednesday night. Where is he now? He's in one big pickle. He's in trouble. That is down here if he's in trouble. Things are all straightened out at headquarters, but he's in trouble down here. Why is he in trouble? Egyptians don't want him. Israelites don't want him. <laughs> well, you talk about bad news. Egypt won't have him. And he goes to the land of the Midianites, and he went into the unemployment office, and he said, I could have a job. And they said, what's your experience? And he said, king. They said, well, we don't need any kings. You had any other experience? Yes, commander-in-chief of the army. Well, we got a commander-in-chief of the army here. How about anything else you qualified for? Well, eating and drinking and making merry. We don't have any of that kind of work either. How about, uh, we have a call here this morning from a man named Jethro. He said he needed a shepherd. A shepherd? A shepherd is an abomination in the eyes of an Egyptian. Why? Well, they smell bad for one thing. All shepherds smell bad. Did you know that? They do. They smell like the sheep. And Egyptians didn't like sheep and they didn't like shepherds. Well, Moses said, give me the card. I'll go out for an interview. <laughs> and he got the job. And the man's daughter as well. And 
went on to the land of Midian, and there he sat for 40 years doing nothing, doing nothing. All his wonderful talent going to waste. Can't you imagine the mimeograph letters he got from Egypt? <laughs> Dear member, <laughs> our organization needs your talents and abilities. If you can do any of the following, will you please notify the committee chairmen at once? Think of all this talent buried in the land of Midian, out in the field, wasn't sheep. All this vast ability, this tremendous talent, this genius, this genius, all going to waste. What's happening? What's, God laid him aside? Yeah, God laid him aside. God had to reduce him to nothing. It took 40 years for Moses to be something. It took 40 more years for God to make him nothing. And after 40 more years, he's ready now because God doesn't need genius. He doesn't need talent. He doesn't need ability. He doesn't need ex-kings and ex-chancellors and ex-generals. He needs broken men. He needs men that can be used. He, he needs men that know that they are nothing. He needs men that know that all the flesh they have is leprous in the sight of God. They need, he needs men that know that what's in his hand is only a rod unless God touch it and make it alive. And he knows that his lips are stammering and he has no eloquence, but if God touches his lips, he can speak with the tongue of an angel and declare the unsearchable riches of Christ. That's the kind of God, man God needs, and it took him 40 years to make one out of this proud, arrogant, intelligent genius. But that's what's going to happen to him in 40 years, and we're not going to fool with that. I just told you that whole story right now, because Hebrews 11, you notice, bypasses that. Because Moses goes into training for 40 years. Now his story takes up when he's graduated from the school of the burning bush. And you'll see a new man now when he goes to keep the Passover and deliver the people of God by the sprinkling of the blood. And that's where we'll be Wednesday night, okay? Well, he's a pilgrim and a stranger, and he's a wanderer and a wayfaring man and exile an abomination in the eyes of the Egyptians. But he is clothed, and he is in his right mind, and he is sitting at the feet of Jesus. Where are you this morning? Oh, just let me say one more thing. While Moses was in the Midian desert, I know there must have been many days when he had the world's view of his own life, when he looked at it as a useless waste of time. Somebody said to me the other day, said, could I have a few minutes of your time, somebody out in the world? And I said, well, you can if you'll keep in mind that you're asking for a few minutes of my life. And the 40 years he spent out there was not just 40 years in time, it was 40 years off his life. Now imagine that many, many, many of those days he got discouraged, don't you think so? And he got up and said, what am I doing here? What am I doing in this place? I ought to be out here where I can be used. What am I doing in this place? Keeping these sheep. Anybody can keep sheep. He must have gotten terribly discouraged. And oh, what a surprise. What, what a glorious surprise God had for that man. He had a destiny for him that Moses just couldn't comprehend at the time. And I, the reason I want to insert this is because i got a thing about you. And i got a thing about me. You may not be keeping sheep on the back side of the desert. I can relate to that somewhat. But you may be keeping sheep on the back side of the desert as far as the world's view of your life is concerned. Your friends and your neighbors may look at you and say, what's a, what's a man doing? Just fooling his life? Well, he's not accomplishing anything. He's not getting anywhere. He'll be there 40 years and just die poor old bankrupt shepherd someday. Well, the world hasn't seen yet what God has in store for each one of us. And one day God's going to reveal that to the world. And it has to do with the blood of that lamb. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word and from you, and we thank you for being enabled to see our own life and the life of Moses, and we pray that every person here has been able to see some, some place in Moses' life where they can relate. 
Help us to decide, Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit where we stand in Moses' experience now. We're looking towards Egypt now for greater things and trying to carve out for ourselves a greater place in Egypt. Or are we looking at Egypt as Moses did by faith? Seeing it as it really is and wanting no more part of it. Are we really taking our stand with the people of God? Are we really willing to suffer whatever reproaches are upon them, bear whatever burdens are upon them, share our lives with them? Are we really associating ourselves with them as we should? And have we really made it known to our friends in the Egyptian court that starting today, don't ever refer to me as the son of Pharaoh's daughter again? Are we really true to what we are inside? Or are we squeezed into the mold of the world, conformed, made like them so that we pass for one of them, using their phrases, their empty, empty phrases, copying their modes and their habits and their fashions, following them in their wiles and in their vices and their habits, seeking their association, their company, their favor. Oh, Father, help us to walk like what we really are, pilgrims and strangers. Help us to manifest to the world like Moses did, that we don't need Egypt. Even if it means 40 years exile in the desert, we don't need Egypt. We need thee. Oh, how we need thee. Help us to love you, Father, as we should. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord bless you.